welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us. And I'm very excited to introduce our very special guest today, who is grandmother Claude Mayo. Claude Mayo grew up in the highlands of Central America in a family of Mayan healers, where she was raised by her mother, a midwife. She travels the globe to share healing and to foster a more spiritual understanding in humanity. Welcome, Grandmother Florida Mayor. How are you? How are you doing today? Thank you so very much, William. It's a great honor to be here with you. I am doing fine, thank you. That's great. So listen, we're going to talk about some very deep things, but before we go there, I, I and I'm sure people who are listening would just love to hear um, something about your, your childhood, um, because you were brought up in a big family, and I gather that your healing and psychic abilities were recognized quite early on, and I'm, I'm wondering, what was that like for you? Yes, um, I was uh, two years old. Uh, when my mother uh, uh, understood and knew uh, where I had expressed uh, to my mother and my older brothers and sisters um, how I experienced the passing of my father. It was like one day he was physically with us and the following day, we had a burial. And of course, that evening, I had an experience. And so, because my mom was always, I would say, every morning, she would ask us, and she would say, son or daughter, she would say, maybe children. What did you dream last night? And I was known to, to be very talkative. And so I said to my mom that I experienced my father being with us in the bedroom, but I described his light body and how he looked. And so my mom at that moment understood that um, I had the capacity to see into the invisible world. There wasn't too much conversation that happened because we were in the middle of mourning and my mom was in preparation for the burial. But that was, that was the beginning of of. My recognition, yes. You, you were part of a very big family, and you had a lot of siblings. Yes, I I am number fifteen. Um, in Central America, yes, they are. There are families with a huge amount of children, and and your fourteen siblings. How were they? nurturing and supportive, or did they make fun of you? What, what was their attitude to you? No, no. Everything was um, very nurturing because everybody had what we call in Spanish uh, a dun, which means that it is a gift from spirit. It is a gift that we are born with. And some of us were very gifted in different modalities from the time that we were little. So everything was n nurtured. And of course, I had a lot of older siblings that supported me. That sounds extraordinarily wonderful. It was if... so, so, so beautiful. So beautiful, yes. So, so the atmosphere in your home then was not, not only had these skills and these gifts, but was also loving. It was loving, it was nurtured, it was understood, and 
it was welcomed because everyone understood. And if we did not understand what the other one was experiencing, our mom would explain it to to the children. And, and of course, my mom was incredibly, incredibly gifted in so many modalities. She was she was quite the queen of of you know of spiritualism, I would say. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got to say that I imagine that there are a whole load of listeners right now going, that sounds like paradise. Uh, we brought up in a family where there was both love and the ability to have that kind of conversation. In my family, there was a lot of love, but my dad was a psychiatrist and my mum was a journalist and I had to keep quiet about my inner experiences. So when I hear about yours, that's just wonderful. So listen, here's my next question, and I'm going to stay with your childhood just for a bit, if we may. As you grew older and you hit hormones and your teenage years, did you manage to stay in the groove of your gifts or were you wobbled by the usual kind of teenage and adolescent stuff that happens? I was not wobbled simply because my foundation was so strong. I could not be wobbled. I was, I was proud. I was, um, I was very, very grateful for the foundation that I had. And in all sincerity, I was not, I was not moved. Um, in fact, when I met my husband in our teenage years, um, I remember he, we were talking about, you know, whatever teenagers talk about. And he kind of commented to me where, you know, at this moment I'm in New York City. And he said to me, I would love to um, get an apartment and live with you. He said something like that. This is like teenage talk, right? So I I said to him, um, I don't think I could do that. That was my, you know, my answer. Oh, I don't, I don't think I can do that. I said to him, because I'm already married. And he said to me, you're married? And I said to him, yes, I'm married to God. Mm -hmm. So what went on with the conversation was, if I'm going to live with you, you have to know of my experiences with the invisible, with the creator, my creator, my, the way my world is outside of this physical body. And so we spend a year in that, in that dialogue. And then, of course, um, we got married. I admire and am inspired by your purity of intention as a young person. And I think that's a crucial message for everybody listening to this conversation, that the purity of intention is an absolute foundation for doing this kind of work um, effectively and with integrity. But listen, I have to ask you, what were you doing in New York? Well, um, my family started migrating um, in the 40s uh, into the States, and the reason for that was that... Um, the situation in Central America, all we have known is war. And my mom always mentioned to us girls that she did not want us to live in Central America and not have a voice of how many children you want to have. And also to have a voice to say that you are in love and to marry the person that you love. And so these things were ingrained, you know, in our, in our subconscious. And um, the time came actually when my father passed away at the eight, I was two years old. And uh, prior to that, my father had um, traveled into the United States because my older brothers and sisters 
were coming into the United States to relocate. And I had uh, an auntie that married a uh, American Marine, and they lived in New York City. So she was our um, person to help us, you know, navigate our lives in the city. And so our journey started in the 40s. As a young person, though, I would imagine there was quite a culture shock between it was, it, it was horrific. I can't even explain it. It was, uh, it was, uh, it it was like taken into another uh, dimension that was uh, unfriendly. Yeah, because you you came out of landscape, a beautiful family, beautiful. into the city of skyscrapers. Just, yeah, absolutely idyllic, everything. And of course, we lived in a ve we lived very simply because um, because of the circumstances in Central America. So um, we, as children, um, had to work, meaning that we worked in the house. We kept we had little gardens that we kept. Um, we grew vegetables. I myself would go out you know, just before noon and ask the neighbors. I had a little basket and I had my little vegetables and see if they were uh, needing anything. And I was uh, <laughs> quite <laughs> quite the sales uh, quite yeah. the sales girl. And I always came back with uh, money and, uh, you know, that, that helped the family. And, and it was great, you know, everything and was good, yeah. That, and then a pal, New York. <laughs> just... then, yes, yes, then... We had uh, this, you know, the concrete yeah. the jungle and everything else that goes with New York. Yeah. yeah. Well, there, there's a huge story there that I, that I would love to unpack some, some other time. So let, let, let's, let, let, let's launch into practice now. I, I, would, I think it'd be really useful for people to know, on, on, do you have a daily rhythm of practice that you wake up and do particular things or do you do particular things through the day? Or is it all so integrated into your life that you just know that your communications with the invisible realms are just, just always there? But do, do, do you pray still or take silence? Absolutely. Absolutely. I spend a lot of time in silence and I'm always in prayer. Everything is about prayer. Every intuitive moment that I have is about prayer. It's about dialogue with, um, with the invisible. Um, I, I, I am very, uh, serious about my prayers, uh, in the evening and also early in the morning. So pe people have different ideas about what prayer is. Could, could you share with us what prayer is for you? Yes, because, um, and I'm going to um, share this with everyone so that it's understood. In Central America, you cannot go to church if you don't monetarily support the church. We did not have money to support the church, so we never had, went to church. Um, my mother her prayers were directed to nature, um, were directed to the mother, the mother meaning the spirit of the feminine. Um, and so I grew up with these prayers of being grateful for everything that we saw, the beauty that we saw, in Central America, the moment in which we were all together, and to be grateful to the sacred elements of life. And it was just a constant gratitude, just gratitude. No matter the hardship of our lives, which there, it, it was, you know, incredible to be able to, you know, to survive so many children, you know. Um, and so there was just this, you know, just incredible uh, 
gratitude. I follow that through throughout my life. Um, Are these prayers that you speak quietly in your mind, or are they just feelings? Is it a conversation? I think it'll really be valuable for all of us too. It's a it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue with the creator. It's 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 exactly a dialogue with the creator. So you're having a conversation with a very real presence. Exactly. Yes. Because I think for a lot of people their prayers are kind of directed at something that's kind of far away. And what I'm hearing you talk about is you're, you're in conversation with an, an all-enveloping presence that's just there with you. Is, is that right? That's correct, yes, yes. I, I see my dialogue with an invisible force that um, is not too far from where I could stretch my arms. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, for, for you, it, it's a tangible presence and, and not an idea. Right. It's a tangible presence and not an idea. Because yes. this is very important because there's a lot of people working in this field who are working with the notion of goddess, god, the mother, as something out there beyond them, as opposed to something that they feel. It's a nurturing feeling. It's, um, yeah, uh, it's, um, it's, I, I, I remember one time having, um, a vision when I was in prayer and I saw this uh, image of a female. And I have had visions of females. And so for me, I think of the creator as, as making, you know, as like a woman, you know, having children and making things, you know. I associate it with Everything that happened in my house was because my mother made it, you know? So my my vision was that I had seen this female sitting in a chair, and I'm just a little tiny little baby, maybe a year, two years old, and and I am at her, um, next to her feet. And so... Another image would be where I would see a very, very enormous woman and and she is of brown skin and she's very, very large, very, very large. I mean, how large, you know, 14 feet, you know, uh, takes up the whole room, you know, and she's just, um, you know, rotundo and just beautiful and naked and um and she does not speak she tones she makes sounds into the different directions and uh and when i when i start my prayers i make you know these uh murmurios is what we call in spanish which is like it's like an inner inner sound and this vibrational sound is a very soothing sound that kind of embraces you with the heart of all of it, all that exists. Would you, this is a leading question, would you say that that prayerful practice and relationship with this loving deity, this mother, goddess, being, creature, mystery, that is the foundation for all your healing and psychic and intuitive work? I can't say it exactly like that because um, my intuitive sense um, 
when it started, you know, as a very, very young child, I was unaware of that feminine figure other than my mother. I was, for example, I was breastfed until I was four. And my mother always embraced us and rocked us children and she would she would do toning uh -huh. and and you know the vibration uh that you would hear you know in her inner body it kind of calmed you and you felt at that moment that whatever you were thinking about whatever you were concerned about disappeared and all you knew is that you were embraced and loved. That is very lovely to hear. Very lovely to hear. Let me start asking you some questions about your intuitive psychic experience and practice. Um, do, you, do you receive messages during your prayers? Yes, but the messages are very short. They're not like... Um, you know, anything that are like paragraphs. There are a few words. Can you give me a couple of examples of what you've intuitively heard in your prayers and how they have worked out to be of use or relevance to you or to others? Of course. Um, let's say that uh, this is that an, actual, an actual prayer. I am in prayer. I am in my bedroom, and I hear an invisible voice. And the voice says to me, it addresses me, Flor de Mayo. I want you to bring people to New Mexico. I'm, I'm still in that state of prayer, but when I heard the voice, I kind of came out came out meaning came out of the silence. And as a human being, I had this dialogue and said, wait a minute, bring people to New Mexico, to my little house? I'm, th I'm thinking. And of course, I'm, I'm in that outside of my prayer. And so I go back into the, the space of prayer. I'm in silence. And the voice says, to me now. So it could be interpreted as a mandate. It could be interpreted as a must to do. And because the it was so huge, the message in my understanding, this was big. I went into prayer for five months before the other part of the prayer came. And the other part of the prayer came in a physical message. And the physical message was a phone call at, it was not even six o'clock in the morning. And I was told that this property that my family had down the road, the people that had bought it, they were leaving the state and for me to come and pick up the keys. So when I went to the property and I stood by myself in the property and it was like, it was like I was in this property for the first time. I had forgotten what the property looked like. And so I am standing there in the property all by myself. And it dawned on me five months later, the message. And then I said, I went into this quiet prayer moment. And I said to my creator, I said, beloved creator, is this where you want me to bring the people to you New Mexico? And the experience was this physical confirmation that is very, very hard to describe. And when I speak about it, 
it puts me into a place of emotion because it is so, so beautiful. But what I felt was like a little bit of a breeze, like a wind. And what this little wind did that it formed and it pressed on my face an invisible kiss. But I felt my cheek being touched and I heard the smack of mm, like that. And, and it was just absolutely incredible. So that confirmation started me on a journey. And then, of course, I kept receiving more and more visions and more dreams on what they wanted me to do. Yes. When was this? This was uh, 2009. Here's a $64,000 question. You said what they wanted me to do. Uh, do, do you have it? You, you know, maybe, maybe you're going to regret having said that. <laughs> can, can you can you can you unpack they? Because I I know in my heart that we have so many ancestors that are got constantly guiding us. Uh, we you know we have uh, some people would say you know we have our angels you know we have our guides. And I say, you know, my ancestors. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and certainly it's more than my mother. It's more than my father. It's my grandmother, great-grandmother. It's everybody, you know. All of my brothers and sisters that have passed, you know, the majority of my brothers and sisters have passed by now, you know. Uh, me, me as the baby. And I have so much gray hair, you know, where we... You know, our my brothers and sisters are just a few of us right now. So I always say they because I I believe in that. I believe that it is a group because the voice that speaks to me, it's not always the same. It's not. Well, that's that's all so interesting and juicy and lovely to listen to. Did, did it all work out for you in that term? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yes, I'm very dedicated, and I am a very, very good listener, and I follow directions 100%. Absolutely, yes. I thought I just, uh, I, I want to draw out a little lesson there for people, which was you listen very carefully, but you spend five months reflecting and then when you acted, you acted. Yes, 100%, yes. It was um, the 40 acres where um, I have created um, the temples for humanity, the, the, sacred, temp the sacred elements of life have, uh, uh, each have a temple. Um, I also put together the Temple of the Golden Child which is uh, the teaching space that I use. And also there I have the seed temple, which, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, each one of these temples have their own incredible journey, incredible message on how all of this came, came to be. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know what I will be dreaming about tonight. Um, if I might, I'll come and have a look. <laughs> let's, let's move on a bit. I'm very curious about um, when you're actually working with someone, where, when they've come to you for help, um, for healing or for counseling or support or direction, um, how, what's your way of tuning into someone's energy and, and how, how do you perceive and interpret what's going on for someone. Okay, so I'm going to take my, my glasses off to kind of explain this. Um, what I do is um, I set up an appointment, okay? I don't want to know anything about the person. 
if they start talking to me about details and, and say, please, please, you don't need to, to say anything, you know, please allow me to, uh, you know, to just look. And then I ask for permission. This for us is very, very important because my mom could not say it enough. You have to ask for permission. And so I do that. And as soon as I do that and the person, you know, says to me, yes, yes, you can look at my field, okay? My field is, you know, outside of the physical body, you know, the etheric body. And so I close my eyes. And as soon as I close my eyes, the physical image of the person starts to move um, in these um, different um, pastel colors. So it's, it's like it might turn first, it, it might be like a very light uh, white, and then it'll change. Another color will come in. So that's when I start hearing when the colors come in, I, I will get one word. And as I do that, I, I reserve these different words, okay? And it'll take maybe like a split second, and then I would open my eyes and I would say to the person, oh, I am uh, seeing this and this and this and that. And the person will then, at that moment, have a chance to have a dialogue with me. And then when the person is saying too much, where I still have my eyes closed, I would go like this, like, like stop, you know, just stop. Because what it is is that they are interfering with what I'm seeing, and I don't want to hear a voice. I want to, you know, continue with what I'm seeing. So then the dialogue starts all over again, and I add to what I saw from before. And uh, before I know it, um, you know, the, um, it's the analysis of what I have seen um, it's, is delivered. And then if the person says to me, uh, you know, would you be able to help me? And if I can help, I would say yes. If I cannot help her, then I would give the person direction on what he or she should be doing uh, in the privacy of their home to to clear their field. Because here's the way my mom's teachings uh, were delivered to us. She could only do 50% of what she's asking us to do. And we had to do the other 50%. My mom was uh, very, very adamant about uh, us knowing when, you know, we were maxed out, where, you know, perhaps maybe our energy was depleted, you know, and what is it that we needed to do? So I, I uh, then... Uh, depending on what I am seeing, I would give them instructions for the person to do what we call sacred bathing. And so the sacred bathings are to clear the, the residue of anything, whether it's, you know, having gone through... Um, an experience, let's say, like a like a, a car accident, you know. Um, I mean, we could talk about anything, you know, giving birth, a newborn baby, uh, all kinds of things, you know, having a contradiction, you know, with your with your partner, you know, where you're in a state of sadness, and how advisable it is for us humans to be in charge of what's going on with us and for us to be able to repair ourselves 
with everyday life, you know, with whatever is going on in our lives, you know, that that we can, uh, you know, help ourselves to cleanse ourselves. So my my teachings are all about empowering, that's the word, empowering the person so that they could go home and take care of themselves, not only themselves, but their families, their children, their um, lovers, their husbands, wives, whatever. You used the word bathing. Yes. Uh, can you just quickly unpack what, what you meant by that? It's, it really intrigued me. Oh, okay, so for us, the word bathe is, um, you know, uh, getting a little bit of water and just pouring it on yourself. You know, in Central America, uh, the ba the word for us, bath, is not going into a bathtub or, you know, not even having a shower head, you know, to have the water flow over you. In Central America, we have little containers that we fill with water and we bathe ourselves, you know, very carefully, you know. And in doing that, it kind of stops you know, you're thinking and you're concentrating on cleansing. I mean, like really, really envisioning that you are releasing, you know, stuff from your body. The sacred bathing is actually a rinse that you do after you have used uh, soap and water to, you know, to wash your hair, your body, so let's say, for example, your body is now rinsed and, and, and clean, right? So the bathing comes with a, um, a container of sacred herbs, and you pour the herbs very gently, you know, with prayer. You, you pour it all over your body, and then you, you let it air dry. You stay there. You continue your prayer, you let it air dry, and it's absolutely incredible. The experience is incredible. That's a very beautiful, homely ceremony of cleansing. I'm very inspired to hear it. Yeah, it's an honoring to our physical body. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. In a strange way, it reminds me of Jesus washing the feet of his friends and disciples. Um, yeah, yeah. I faith. have done, uh, you know, many foot washing with with the herbs. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. In in ceremony, yes. Do you also get messages in your dreams that you take notice of? Oh, absolutely. Can yeah. Can you give me an example? Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you an example, and I'm also going to share with everybody that I am an absolute lover of animals and nature. So I find that I receive messages from, you know, from animals, and I'll give um, I'll give you a um, um, an example. Um, this is a very very sweet uh, example. I had. Um, this uh, little puppy uh, before our daughter was born. And her name was Maya. And she was just this little white little little puppy dog. Um, and she lived to be 18 years old. So she was there the whole time that the children were being born and lived our daughter, see, she saw our daughter like graduating, you know, <laughs> she was still with us. But what, what Maya would do in dream, let's say, for example, one of the children had an earache, okay? And I would see her in a dream. She was still physically with us. And she would come in a dream and she would be walking like if you can imagine a, a dog walking on its hind legs and she would talk to me and she would say, um, I think that blah, 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 the name of the child uh, needs 
this medication for the earache. <laughs> and I would have this, um, how should I say, kind of like a, a remembrance of one of my mom's um, tools for he you know, for he for healing ear egg. So she would come to me um, throughout the whole life and and even after uh, those eighteen years. So that was my relationship with this beautiful, beautiful dog that I love so much. She was like um like like a true, true friend. Yes. That's a beautiful story. People will want to know what what, what breed was she? Was your uh, she was just an ordinary little dog. Um, I was in New York City, and there was an old man with the mom and all the puppies outside in the street, and we stopped, my husband and I, and we said, oh, you know, look at the, we're looking at your puppies, and he said, I'm giving them away, you know, do you want one? It was a rescue dog. Yeah, yeah, it was a rescue dog. And how, how, how big was it? Um, she probably got to be about 40 pounds. Okay. Yeah. You know, just pure love. And of course I raised her as my baby, you know, she, she's just this uh, really beautiful, loving, loving dog. Now, um, you know, in the last uh, 10 years, 15 years, I had another, uh, little dog and this dog was so precise and very in extremely intuitive. And how I received this little doggy was that I woke up one morning and I said to my husband, I said, you know what? I really feel that I must have a puppy. It was this feeling of wanting a puppy. And so my my husband's work was in a situation where um, he helped families. And he found a little tiny little puppy in one of these, you know, jobs that he went to, and he brought me home this tiny little scruffy little puppy with big whiskers, your little terrier dog. And she was magical. She was absolutely magical. Everything about her was magical. And one day I was very, very worried and I was praying and praying and praying, and she would sleep right underneath my neck, mm. my little baby girl. Yeah. And I went into a dream, and she had this beautiful way of opening the dream veil with her little, with her little nails, and she would come in. And she said to me, don't, you know, sign the, you know, the papers that I was worrying about, that I was you know, thinking that I had to sign these legal papers. She said to me, you know, the, the papers that I was going to sign with the person, she, she said first name and last name, and she said to me, he's going to be found to be a charlatan. That's, that's a word that I don't use. But I looked at her and I said, what? She said to me, don't sign the papers. But anyway, the next day, we had a meeting. I had a meeting with the lawyer and this person. And I said, you know, of course, the lawyer and the person said all kinds of positive things, how good it is for me to sign this contract. And at the end of all of that, I said to everybody, I, I am not going to sign the contract. <laughs> Fantastic. You listen to you. I listened, I listened to my beautiful, you know, my beautiful doggy. But six months later, as she predicted, it all came true. So she was my personal oracle. She told me so many things in my life. It was so beautiful. And I missed her in my heart. I mean, she is in my altar. I hold her in my heart. And she's, you know, she was just a little ordinary little doggy, mm -hmm. but somehow she called me that morning, you know, that she wanted to come to my house. It was so sweet. That's, that's wonderful. Listen, it, it makes me very sad, but we're coming to the end of our conversation. Um, I think everybody who's listening who has animals in their homes will be going, okay, yes, I need to be more 
careful and listening to them. So listen, before it, this has been a wonderful conversation, just wonderful, touched my heart. I, d I just wish I could, I would like to bottle essence of you and put you into every family on the globe. But listen, before we end, do you have a, a, a particular message or hint or thing that you'd like to say to the people who are listening? Is there anything in particular that comes to your heart, out of your heart, people? Each and every one of us are born with this gift, this intuition, this sixth sense. Every one of us have it. The thing is that we have to be very good listeners. And there is always the action behind the prayer. So those are my words for the, for the, for the group. Say it again. Say it again. Just, it'd be good to hear that message again. Okay. That each and every one of us are born with that gift, that sixth sense gift, that intuition. We always feel something. And so when we feel it, it's because it is a prayer. And behind the prayer, there is always the action. My prayer was telling my husband, I need a puppy. I, I need to have a puppy today. And so when the prayer was answered was when the puppy was brought to me. That was the answer to my prayer. So for all of us, follow your intuition, follow what you're feeling in your heart, and act on it. And of course, when you receive it, open your arms and say, thank you. Thank you, beloved creator. And finally, do you have a blessing, a little prayer that you'd like to say for us all? Absolutely. And before you do, thank you, Grandmother Flodemir, for your time and your participation has been really wonderful. Thank you. Much blessings to you. Love and light to you. Thank you. Beloved creator, beloved beauty, mother, father, creator of the heavens and the earth, beloved beauty, you are the heart of the heavens and the heart of the earth, beloved creator. I want to thank you on this beautiful, beautiful, precious day for bringing us together in this beautiful, beautiful circle of light, beloved beauty. This circle, this movement around the globe, each and every one of us in the four directions. Beloved beauty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much to you. Thank you.